The most important part is the relationship between infectious diseases or microorganisms and humans. I don't know if you know this, but infection and communicable disease are a little bit different. What we comprehensively call infection, if you look at the pyramid shape here, when the pathogenic organism enters, at the very bottom there would be those who were exposed but was not infected. They are not patients. Because the symptom wouldn't even start. The second case would be the ones who are infected but don't have any symptoms. The infection without clinical illness, one step above would be mild illness, and then severe disease and finally death. Whether there are symptoms or not, if the pathogenic organism exists, it is called infection. Infectious diseases are pathogenic organisms entering our body, destroying the tissues and having pathogenic phenomenons and symptoms like fever. Communicable diseases are the ones that spread quickly between humans, such as cholera, dysentery, and salmonella typhi. Some don't spread quickly between humans, like tetanus by toxin or staphylococcus. We included all of the diseases in the communicable disease category, but there are some diseases that don't spread well, so currently we use the terms infection or infectious diseases. When you go abroad as a volunteer, there will be humans, microorganisms, and mediums such as mosquitoes or ticks. The interaction between the three, which are human, microorganisms, and the environment, will validate infectious disease. We call these the three factors of infectious disease, but if you count the mosquitoes or ticks that possess the pathogenic organism that serves as a vector, then there would be four factors. In the human factor, there are age, gender, various genetic disorders, and so on. From the microorganism factor, there are a virus, bacteria, fungus, and strongyle. The environment could be influenced by temperature, humidity, different living environments, pollution, food, and such things. When these infectious diseases are established, there is a concept called a chain of infection. Here is a circle. First, hosts like children, aged, or those with chronic diseases might be more vulnerable because they have the susceptibility to infection by not having enough immunity. When microorganisms enter, there is a reservoir that they possess. And there is also a port of exit for microorganisms. In the infection process, there are droplet infection and contagious infection, which can then be divided into direct or indirect. There's also vector-borne infection, and it also varies depending on how the bacteria enters the host body, like through the respiratory system, skin, or urinary mucous membrane, and so on. So you should consider this chain of infection and understand the whole concept to help prevent diseases. So the prevention and management of infection would be cutting the chain of infection. So as I said, cutting the chain of infection is a way to prevent and manage infectious diseases, from susceptible host to an infectious agent, reservoir, port of exit, and so on. And once it develops, it would create some kind of circle that infects others. If this circulation continues, then it will become an epidemic, because the only way to block the infection is to know the transmission route. If you shake hands, kiss, have sexual intercourse, or deliver droplets, then its direct-indirect transmission involves the transmission through environmental surface contamination of food, blood, organ tissue, etc. And transmission through media such as transmission through the mosquito, tick, airborne, aerosol, etc. So we already talked about how infectious diseases occur. Once we're exposed to certain pathogens and the source of infection and those pathogens enter susceptible hosts, some will pass without experiencing the symptoms, but a considerable number develop symptoms. After they develop the symptoms, some of them will recover naturally and others might develop natural processes. They might die without any medicine, or even if they receive treatment. We see many of the cases in COVID-19. Not all of them die, but only 2% to 3% do. This natural progress, the progress of the infection, and the results so not all of the pathogens lead to the actual infection. There are subclinical, clinical, and some only experience slight symptoms and recover. Others stay as carriers. It all varies. Some might die. Others might recover and develop antibodies and never get the same disease again. An outcome like this can be deduced. You have to understand this process. The outcome of the infection is being exposed to the pathogen, being infected, seeing the symptoms, and seeing some of them fight the disease and die. We call those who died from the disease the case of fatality rate, and those who died from the entire number, whether they have symptoms or not, are called infection fatality rate. Depending on the pathogens, the rate of subclinical and clinical is different. For polio, only one from a thousand will experience symptoms, 
once the pathogen enters the body, and the symptoms can be very severe. Most of them don't experience any symptoms. However, in the case of rabies, when a person is bitten by animals that possess rabies virus from badgers or raccoons, 99% of them show symptoms, and it's really fatal. The incubation period is also different. We normally see the incubation period for COVID-19 as 2 to 14 days, but 5 days on average. This also varies by the pathogen. For the flu, the incubation period is 1 to 3 days. It is very short. But for HIV, it's really long. For hepatitis A, the incubation period is quite long. It is 14 days to 50 days. For food poisoning, we see many cases of salmonella food poisoning and its incubation period within 6 to 48 hours. For microorganisms as well, they show different toxicity by each character. We don't really differentiate pathogenicity with virulence generally. But pathogenicity overpowers the defense mechanism of the host and therefore has a greater ability for infection. So when we say that the pathogenicity is high, then it means the incidence rate is high. Virulence indicates that a tendency to be infected is high. We use both of these terms, but if you look at the bottom of this page, Staphylococcus aureus and colon bacillus are shown to have high pathogenicity. Some colon bacillus shows low pathogenicity, but the important part is considering both pathogenicity and virulence for each pathogen. For the mechanism factor, there is a minimum infective dose. One or two viruses can't infect humans. When somebody sneezes or coughs and transmits one virus to another person through the mucous membrane in the eye or nose, it wouldn't lead to infection. There's a minimum number. This is called the minimum infectious dose. Here, the disease that can be infected even through small amount of virus from the respiratory system is the rhinovirus, which is cold. For diarrhea, for Shigella, only 10 to 100 bacteria can occur diseases. But for cholera, you need at least 100 million. So you need to understand that each bacterium has a different minimum infective dose. The host factor is also very important. Because depending on the age, genetic factor, nutritive conditions, pregnancy, or stress, a person can either be strong or weak to infectious diseases. The younger and healthier, the less likely to be infected. But infants, pregnant women, elders, cancer patients, or even if you're stressed, you're more prone to be infected. So, you should know these body factors because it is very important in preventing the infection. Once microorganisms enter the body, they colonize, proliferate, penetrate through the tissue, destroy them, spread all over the body, and make people die, recover or progress the disease as chronic. In this process, we activate a delicate defense mechanism, the host defense mechanism. Our immune system consists of three steps. The first is the physical defense that physically covers our body, such as skin and mucous membrane. Here, different immunity exists, such as antibodies from the mucous membrane and other antibacterial. And the normal germs inside our mucous membrane block the pathogens. The second line of defense is the hemophagocyte. The complement, various inflammatory response substances, in K cell, etc., that are under the skin, and the two combined are called natural immunity. The next red one is proactive immunity. It's specially operated on specific patients with pathogens, but it takes time. It takes one to seven days, and the third defense line is very strong. The B cells and T cells. B cells create an antibody to neutralize pathogens, and T cells directly attack the pathogens to destroy them. The third defense line is proactive immunity, the strongest immunity system. The strongest immune system is proactive immunity, which is humoral immunity and cellular immunity. Cellular immunity is B cell. It generates antibody for B cells to customize the antibody that suits each pathogen takes around seven days. IgM first appears, then IgG. Within two to three weeks, most antibodies are all generated. These antibodies strongly neutralize the pathogens and defend our body. Next, cellular immunity is T-cell. It attacks and destroys the cells contaminated by germs. It is called the cytotoxic T-cell. This is also a very strong defense system. So the innate immunity and cellular immunity cooperate to defend our body. Lastly, the environmental factor. For the environmental factor, most changes have occurred in the ecosystem of the Earth. 
climate changes, deforestation, urbanization, changes in temperature and humidity, to the global warming that we've recently been experiencing. Everything is focused towards the city, and the suburban area is going through ghettoization with severe pollution. The living environment of Southeast Asia or Africa is very poor, making it suitable for infectious diseases to spread. Building dams, destroying the natural environment, the forest destruction, destroying the habitat of wild animals, mosquitoes, and other vectors live near the dams, so this could be another reason for infectious diseases. Schistosomiasis, malaria, breakbone fever, all these diseases are created from the habitat of malaria, mosquito larvae, which are mostly seen from stagnant water. Most of these changes are created by humans. This is why we should consider preserving our natural environment seriously. Food poisoning takes up the largest proportion of disease created by environmental changes. As the temperature goes up due to environmental changes, things start to decompose, which leads to waterborne infection and infectious diseases with food as a medium. The second would be a mosquito, tick-borne infection. The recent Zika, Chikungunya, Malaria, and Dengue, but in Korea tick-borne infections such as SFTS and scrub typhus is increasing. The increase of mosquito habitat would lead to the West Nile virus, Chikungunya, Zika, and the spread of intercontinental spread is also increasing. This is the last slide. In corresponding to infectious diseases, we always have to think about the three factors, human, microorganism, and the environment. Also, one health preserving the natural environment, and avoiding environmental destruction would be the key. The main point of today's lecture was how humans, microorganisms, and the environment can be the three factors of establishing infectious diseases, and knowing the characteristics of each can be the key to preventing and managing infectious diseases.